very happy to be here this morning and uh, speaking about something that I think is common to everyone in this room, and that's the question of vocation. My understanding of vocation is really vocation as encounter. And I think that that is going to be a theme that's going to reappear uh, uh, continually throughout today. Uh, vocation begins with the word. The word that created the universe, the word that calls us into communion one with another. Uh, in the beginning was the word, as John says in the prologue. Uh, and the word is what has called us into being. Uh, in the first uh, chapter of Genesis, God said, let us make humankind in our own image in the likeness of ourselves. God, in God's self, is relational, is uh, a being that calls us into relation with, with God and with one another. And as Christians, we believe, we believe that Christ himself is that which gives order and life to the whole universe. And part of our vocation is, in a certain sense, putting ourselves in relationship to that loving Christ, that loving uh, spirit of God that calls us into communion one with another. This particular quote is taken from a Eucharistic prayer. And it speaks about our common priestly vocation. We're all priests, by the way. We're all priests. It, as Aidan Kavanaugh, famous liturgist, used to say, it is more correct theologically to say that we are all baptized priests while some of us are ordained presbyters. And so this particular uh, part of the Eucharistic prayer, when the time at last had ripened and the earth grown full in abundance, you created in your image man and woman the crown of all creation. You gave us breath and speech that all the living might find a voice to sing your praise. One of the common spiritual themes uh, that runs throughout the fathers of the church and other the great spiritual writers is that human beings with consciousness are able to give voice to the rest of creation. That makes us responsible for the rest of creation. That gives us a responsibility to act uh, correctly in terms of the environment, in terms of uh, just, just everything that, that, that there is, because we as, as, as beings with consciousness have a voice, have words, again, to relate back to God what God has given us, which is life. So this word of life constantly calls us. Each day, the presence of God constantly calls us, and this word constantly calls us into being and into relationship. There are certain moments in our life, however, where the word calls us to make certain decisions about what we should be doing, about our own life, about our own way of being in the world. Through baptism, all of us have a special calling to share in the divine life. Uh, on the screen is a uh, famous icon, uh, orthodox icon, of the resurrection. And it's interesting. The or and I, I really like this image because it underlines the whole rela relationality of the reason for why Christ came, why Christ suffered, died, and was resurrected. This is also called the harrowing of fell. So you have Christ standing on the jaws of hell, on the two doors that have been broken down, and on either side of Jesus are Eve and Adam. And he's, he's dra dragging them out of Sheol. And if you look, you can't see it too well, but there are, uh, with the, underneath the doors there, there are locks and chains and keys and, and that kind of thing. What Christ came to do and what the re resurrection accomplished was to free us to give us life, to make us uh, people of liberty and happiness. And what Christ is doing is, is, is bringing humanity together as one through his resurrection. In a real sense, our vocations are calling us to do the same. When we say we're Christians, we're called to enter into that loving relationship with God that gives us the power that flows from the resurre resurrection to share that love 
and liberation that comes from God. Let's talk about a few biblical models of call then. Uh, call to God to trust. You know, faith is one of those words that we sometimes misconstrue. We get the sense that faith is about ideas, that faith is about concepts, that faith is about propositions about God. But that's not really true. What is faith really? Faith in the scriptures, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, has more to do with trust than with having the right ideas in your mind. Trust in God's love, trust in God's outreach to, to each one of us, trust that uh, in, in God's providence. Many religious founders of religious communities were convinced of God's providence, and that helped them uh, while they were in the process of founding their, their religious communities. Um, and this whole question of call, then, is a call to trust in God, in God's goodness, that God is on our side. In the Eastern liturgy, there's a constant refrain where God is called ho philanthropos. O oh God, you who love humanity. You who love humanity. That's the God that we proclaim. And that's the God in whom we're called to trust and to have faith. Now, this call that everyone receives through baptism, through the events in their life, uh, this call is not given just to us as individuals. The call is given uh, to us in the context of community. This is sometimes hard for some of us in, the, in uh, North American culture to understand because we have such an individualistic notion of God and how God comes to us. It's Jesus and me sometimes. But that is not the biblical notion of God because you can't have just Jesus and me. No one can be a freelance Christian. God relate, relates to all of us and calls us together in community. And to understand who God is, we have to understand that we are members of a community, which is called the church. Let's look at Abraham. Abraham, uh, where God called Abraham, the call that Abraham received, and the faith response. Abraham is called our father in faith. And what, was, what, was, what had happened? God called him, and the Lord said to Abraham, Go forth from the land of your kinsfolk and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. And all, then a little bit later in, in that chapter, all the communities of the earth shall find a blessing in you. There's that individual call and the repercussion of that call to a larger community. So when we talk about vocation, we're talking about something that's going to have a repercussion on other people always. It's not just something that one receives and keeps to oneself. One of the, the great writers of the church, 4th century, I put his name up because it sounds funny, Theodore of Maswestia. Uh, he, he's sometimes called Teddy the Mop. Uh, a Cappadocian father. Uh, he said, this is this typical of, of kind of the, uh, the way in which uh, uh, religious truth is found. He said that Abraham knew he was going in the right direction after he was called by God uh, when he didn't know where he was going. God calls us to have trust in God. God calls us in a certain, and in, 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 in you don't know exactly what's going to happen. I can say, everyone in this room, uh, you, you, when, you, when you first heard God's call, and obviously you did because you wouldn't be sitting here, you responded in, in a certain way. You didn't know what the ramifications were going to be. Now, this is true for all kinds of calls, all kinds of specific vocations that we have. If you asked married people when they were getting married, do you know exactly what's going to happen? And most of them say, well, thank God we didn't. <laughs> because there would have been a lot of challenges that we probably couldn't be, we wouldn't be able to have, have, have entertained except by living them out. That's true also for priesthood. That's true for any Christian vocation. 
that when you say yes to God, you're saying yes to a future that you're not quite certain what's going to happen. I never thought years ago that I'd ever end up here speaking in front of you. Uh, we've all had the, these, these various calls in various ways in which we've answered those calls. And uh, it's impossible for us to obviously know exactly what's going to happen, but that is what the question of faith is all about. And faith and response to a vocation. That we say yes to the unknown. Knowing that God is going to be there to support us. Now this comes from uh, an encyclical by Pope John Paul II. See, each Christian vocation comes from God and is God's gift. However, it is never bestowed outside of or independently of the church. Instead, it always comes about in the church and through the church. Because, as the Second Vatican Council reminds us, God is willed to make people holy and save them, not as individuals without any bond or link between them, but make them into a people who might acknowledge God and serve in holiness. Now, when I say the church, it's important you keep in mind, and when, when the Pope is, is talking about the church here, with the capital C, we're not talking about people, o only the people that you see walking around with, with miters and croziers and, and the hierarchy. The church is us. This is the context where we find vocation. This is the context that brings forth and gives us a, a sense of how God is calling us. If we were living by ourselves, totally by ourselves, it would be very difficult to have a vocation. <laughs> our vocation and our call from God is often mediated by the people with whom we live and work. And that's basically what, uh, uh, what the Pope is trying to get at here. But it's, it's, a, it's a vocation grounded in, in the community. And God calls us even in light of our limitations. If you look at the scriptures, look at Moses. Moses, one of the great uh, figures of the, uh, of the Old Testament, uh, and he says to God what God calls him after the burning bush, Lord, I have never been eloquent neither in the past nor recently, nor now that you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and tongue. God reveals God's self to, to, to Moses in the burning bush and says, now go to Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go. But Moses doesn't speak well. He's afraid of public speaking. <laughs> and he's supposed to speak to the most powerful person in the world. Yet, God calls him nevertheless. Sometimes when we receive a call, we also feel unworthy. We're, we feel unworthy of this call that God could possibly have given us. Can I do it? First of all, my limitations. But second of all, I'm not holy enough. I'm not good enough. This is the, the reaction of Isaiah. Isaiah in the temple, in Isaiah 6, where he's, uh, he receives this, this resplendent vision of who God is. And he says, woe is me, I am doomed, for I am a man of unclean lips, yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. The idea was that, that someone who is impure and, uh, and unworthy would basically be, uh, be destroyed by God. But that's not that that, that Time and time again, that is not the case. And that's what the scriptures want to emphasize. That even though we might feel unworthy, God still calls us. As, as, as some Pope Francis, he says so many good things lately. Uh, one of the good things he said is that we're not a church of the pure. We're not a church of everyone is perfect. Of course, we knew that already. But for the Pope to say that, that's pretty good. Okay. Okay, vocation to ministry, a call to discipleship for the sake of Christ's mission. A call to follow Jesus in order to accomplish what Jesus came to do. That we share in that mission that Christ has given us. We share in the, the, the kinds of things that he did while on earth. And we continue his presence, in a sense, through our actions, through sharing in this call 
is vocation to ministry. It's a relational call. As I mentioned before, it's a call to both discipleship and a call to holiness. And holiness is conceived not as some kind of otherworldly kind of idea. that When you think of holy, you think of something totally outside your experience, perhaps. But holy, in, in the real biblical sense of the term, and in the sense of so many spiritual uh, uh, people who, who have taught throughout the ages, holiness is found in the here and now, in the everyday, in our relationships with one another. It's not necessarily found in the hermitage. It can be found there. But part of the, the, the great gift that we received, uh, especially through the Second Vatican Council, was the understanding that holiness and this call to holiness is something that we receive in our own life, in our here and now, in our everyday. Uh, and it's not just for religious and priests. It goes beyond that. It goes beyond that. That's a particular vocation. And uh, I certainly would hope that uh, religious and priests are called to holiness as well. But all the church is called to holiness. Uh, as Lumen Gentium, the uh, dogmatic constitution on the church, states so well, it is therefore quite clear that all Christians in whatever state or walk of life are called to the fullness of Christian life and to the perfection of charity, and that this holiness is conducive to a more human way of living even in society here on earth. It's not an otherworldly call to holiness. It's supposed to have ramifications here and now in how we live our lives. And it's supposed to make the world better. It's supposed to improve the world. Any Christian vocation is supposed to improve the world. It's supposed to make living together uh, more happy, more health, more joyous. And so this engagement, the call to holiness, is engagement with the world. Some of you, there was a, a, Sandra Snyder spoke last night, she was here, and spoke about how our ideas about the world have changed. Prior to the council, the world was something to be avoided, something to be, uh, the, the fuga mundi, as they say in Latin, where you, f you flee the world in order to attain holiness. That's not what vocation is, especially as it's, it's conceived of uh, after the Second Vatican Council. Now, there are, are waves of speaking about specific callings or vocations. For example, who God calls us to be is a question of our self-identity, who we are, how we're called to respond to God as, as individuals, what our, what our personal convictions are and ways of acting or ways of, of, of understanding ourselves. Secondly, there's how God calls us to live our state of life. Does God call, call us to, to priesthood, to religious life, to uh, committed uh, lay people in the church? Uh, how, that, uh, how God calls us to live to the state of life will then also then determine what we'll be able to do later. And then what God calls us to do is the ministry that we undertake. All of these things are taken together and they influence what our principal vocation is going to be. Particular vocations, though, are multiple and overlapping. What is my vocation? Well, okay, I'm a priest. But that's not all I am. I'm a teacher. I'm now an administrator. I now, sometimes I'm a crisis counselor. Uh, those are overlapping vocations that we're called to that uh, are, are basically we, we decide we're going to engage in because of our state of life, because of who we are. Uh, and it's rooted in individual gifts and conditioned by state of life. You know, what kind of talents do we have? How are our talents exercised? And how do we put those talents at the service of others? And I may be called to many ministries in the course of my life. Those of us who have been around for a while know that that's true. <laughs> you just don't do one thing. That as God calls, that God calls every day, and God calls us in decisive moments, God calls us uh, at various moments in our life to respond, and that response is new ministries, perhaps, that we undertake. OK, 
Okay, ministry could be considered what God calls me to do to contribute to the mission of the church. And this mission of the church is an essentially ecclesial call, as we talked about before. It's in the context of the church that we receive this call. Prior to the council, the term and on some of the documents of the council talk about ministry as apostolate. Have you ever heard that word? The apostolate. The apostle of the laity is usually uh, largely how it's said. But another way of talking about apostolate is talk about ministry. Okay? Uh, and this is from the decree on the apostle of the laity from the Second Vatican Council. And even though the, the, the verbiage is a bit archaic, it says something very important. Every activity of the mystical body, in other words, of the church, of the, of the community, of the people who believe, with this in view, does by the name of apostolate, which the church exercises through all its members, though in various ways. In fact, the Christian vocation is of its nature a vocation to the apostolate as well. We can't be Christians. We can't consider ourselves Christians unless we're engaged in some form of ministry. And that ministry comes from God. And this is derived directly from Christ. Lay people's right and duty to be apostles, to be involved in ministry, to be people who are sent, apostoline, derives from their union with Christ, their head. Inserted as they are in the mystical body of Christ by baptism and strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit in confirmation, it is by the Lord himself that they are assigned to the apostolate. Now, this is an important statement because it says that, uh, that your call to ministry is not necessarily mediated always by someone in the hierarchy. It can be ordered by someone in the hierarchy, but it's not the call itself is not mediated by that. You receive from God this call to minister. And it's part and parcel of being a Christian. It comes with baptism. Uh, this is something that uh, people uh, have a hard time with sometimes. Because uh, so going into parishes and that kind of thing, and, and uh, sometimes it's, well, whatever Father wants. Now, that's fine. I mean, it's good to work together with the priests. So I'm certainly not going to say that it's a bad idea. But the issue is... That you yourself are authorized by God to engage in ministry. You're also authorized to collaborate and to cooperate. But that the, the impetus to ministry itself, to serve others in the name of Christ, comes with baptism. So baptism is the source in our union with Christ. It's baptism is our initiation into community, a royal priesthood. One of the rediscoveries of Vatican II is that baptism changes everything. That through our baptism, we're called to be members of the community. We're called to engage in ministry. Uh, and this baptismal call to serve the mission comes through the community. Ministry is, is how all baptized engage in activities to build up the body of Christ and serve its mission of witnessing, celebrating, and advancing the reign of God. So theologically, this is the basis for all Christian ministry. Now, there's a particularity of lay ecclesial ministry. You've heard that phrase. Lay ecclesial ministry is that particular ministry which is not simply a ministerial response that one feels uh, directly called by God, but also one that's acknowledged by the church in, in, a, in, a, in a public way. So lay ecclesial ministry, many people who come to CTU are called to lay ecclesial ministry. Uh, see, all ministry uh, ecclesial in the, is ecclesial in the sense that it's rooted in baptism and flows from the church community. Lay ecclesial ministry rooted in baptism, and involves a formal and public service on behalf of the church. And the, the bishop's document, Co-Workers in the Vineyard of the Lord, states, ministry is ecclesial because it has a place within the community of the church whose communion and mission it serves 
and because it is submitted to the discernment, authorization, and supervision of the hierarchy. They had to throw that in. Uh, <laughs> but the hierarchy conceived of as the people who order the church. It's not that people are, are you know, writing off or you know, checking off everything you're doing uh, in, in offices in Rome, of course. It's a question of cooperating with those who are ordering the church because it's a public ministry. You do it in the, publicly in the name of the church. This is one of my favorite paintings. I, in fact, I have a reproduction of it in my office. This is one of the Pope's favorite paintings. In fact, it was this painting that inspired his motto on his coat of arms. Does anyone know the motto of the Pope? I'll say it in Latin, then I'll translate it. Miserando atque eligendo. Having mercy, God chose him. God calls him. It comes from a commentary on this, uh, uh, this calling of Matthew that's found in the Gospel of, of Matthew uh, by Bede the, Bede the Venerable. The idea is that having mercy, God calls us. Having love, God calls us. And this particular painting is done by Caravaggio in uh, the year 1599. It's found in a church called St. Louis of the French in Rome. And if you look carefully at the comp what, what Caravaggio is doing here is giving us a theological uh, explanation of what's going on. On the right, you see Christ with his arm extended. And right in front of Christ is St. Peter, kind of almost imitating Christ's gesture. And on the left, you see Matthew. He's in the center of the composition or center of the group on the left, pointing to himself, Lord, you're choosing me. And of course, Matthew is the tax collector. Now, we're not, in order to understand this, Matthew is tax collector. We're not talking about someone who's working for the IRS. Tax collectors understood as someone who basically was uh, in, char in charge of extorting money from people as well as collecting taxes. Okay, so we're not, we're not talking about someone who is considered morally pure, morally upright, uh, the best kind of person. So Matthew is pointing to himself saying, you're choosing me? M me I'm a tax collector. I'm impure. I'm, I'm sinful. I'm, I'm all that. Look at the, uh, the gesture of Christ more closely. Caravaggio painted after Michelangelo. And do you remember the creation of Adam in the Sistine Chapel? Where the hand of God reaches out to Adam to give Adam life. It's the same gesture. Christ calling Matthew to life by choosing Matthew. New life more abundant life, life that's joyous, life that is fulfilling. And of course, Peter is there too, kind of representing the church, kind of trying to imitate that. <laughs> but the, the basic call comes from Christ. But the issue is our free response to this. Christ is calling Matthew, but he's calling everyone else there at the table as well. Some people simply aren't paying attention. Look at the folks on the right. What are they looking at? Money. They're looking at the taxes they've collected. They have absolutely no interest in, uh, in Jesus. Other folks, though, uh, Matthew in particular, have received that call. Here's a last word from, from Pope Francis. We're quoting the Pope a lot these days. Have you noticed? And he said, he said this, and I think it's important as we begin a day discussing ministry and discussing vocation. This is a, a quote that I find particularly relevant. This is a Catholic faith reduced to mere baggage, to a collection of rules and prohibitions, to fragmented devotional practices, to selective and partial adherence to the truths of the faith, to occasional participation in some sacraments, to the repetition of doctrinal principles, to bland or nervous moralizing, that does not convert the life of the baptized would not withstand the trials of time. 
we must all start again from Christ. That's the point. Uh, and with Pope Benedict XVI, that being Christian is the encounter with an event, a person which gives life a new horizon and a decisive direction. Any Christian vocation, any Christian vocation to ministry, has to be rooted on a deep and intimate relationship with Christ. And whatever we do, whatever we study, whatever uh, aspects of the ministry we're interested in, has always got to be rooted in that relationship to Christ, who is God's word to humanity, who reaches out with love to each one of us, and who calls us to a full and more abundant life. Thanks a lot.